Let's see. Well, I was about 11 years old, and I was in my parents' room. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Sunday Communion Podcast, where we have free flow conversations with friends about their lives, their past, present, and what's in store for our future. We discuss overcoming obstacles, spiritual experiences, next chapters, life's profound moments in a warm communion with a friend. Together, we dive deep into the journey of personal growth and collective healing by healing ourselves and sharing those journeys. I'm your host, Lee Papa. Join us. In this part one of two of the interview with Shannon Torrance, Shannon reflects on her early years in a suburban family with warm resonance and gratitude. Yet this story unfolds with unwrapping early childhood trauma with a large birthmark on her face, becoming mute as a child, seeing a UFO, and facing a communication obstacle that would be woven through her years, losing her voice even into adulthood. Be sure to follow this very interesting account of self-awareness and spiritual healing with Shannon. Part two will be longer than usual and has been edited down from the original, as well as interwoven clips from my personal mediumship reading with Shannon are included. Hope you enjoy that. So enjoy part one and be sure to subscribe and hit that reminder notification bell so you don't miss a thing. The very beautiful thing that came out of doing the interview with Shannon for her podcast was that we became fast and furious friends. So welcome, Shannon. I can't wait to do this with you. Thank you too. I love being with you in any capacity. So extra happy when we can podcast together. So tell us about yourself, Shannon. Who is Shannon Torrance? Um, Yes. So I am a professional voice actor. I have been doing that for about 25 years. And so that means I voice commercials and promos and explainer videos and phone systems and e-learning and video games and animated projects. I don't do audiobooks. That's about all I don't do. Yeah. That's fun. I, I have actually done now two audiobooks. I did I voiced my own book, Temple of All Knowing, and then I voiced a book that's a romantic, uh, kind of like a Hallmark movie book. I could see you being amazing at that so much fun. It's called Santa Baby. So tell me what of all those genres, what do you enjoy the most? I enjoy animation and video games the most. It's the thing I do the least professionally, which is the case with most voice actors is that they have their animation people and they have their big video game people. But I love when I get to do things like that because it's real acting um, as opposed to sharing commercial information about a product, which I enjoy doing, but a lot of the stuff I do is technical. So it's more like, oh, this is what our company does. And in 1929, we were founded by this person and these are the services we offer. And it's fun, but I like to play characters. So that's my favorite thing to do. What are the kind of characters? Can you do one for us? Oh gosh. I, I don't, I mean, I like I don't do a lot of little kids, but I like doing little kids or little animals or things like that. Where my brother has a purple queen and my mom. Like something like that. But most of the things I get well, cast for are usually moms. I, like just they're me. You know, they're just me, but they happen to be an animal. Or they are video game characters. The last one I played was a British nun from the Middle Ages, and she wanted to fight. She always had fantasies of actually being on the battleground. So she teams up with this group of actual soldiers, and they all go on this grand adventure together. And she's very prim and proper, but at the last minute, she can do some ninja stuff. She's probably around 60, so she's just more um, proper. She'll just be so, she's so sort, of, sort of like stern and very strict if, if you don't know her and then when you get to know her she's actually quite funny and so she's like that's kind of a character I like to play and then I've played like a British fairy but she's not really from Britain she's from fantasy land so you know she might just be sort of a Tinkerbell character and so yeah she I do a lot of British little characters and things like that that sounds fun yeah I really enjoy that yeah I love animal movies that talk 
So, yes. you know, any kind of, you know, some somewhat animation, but even the ones that aren't animation, but have talking animals. I'm all in for those. Yeah, I did one called The Wolf Pack, where I played the mom, Janice, and they described her as um, a modern family type of mom. Mm -hmm. So she's like kind of dorky but cool she's like cool mom but she's kind of dorky and may and tries to be funny a lot but her son's rolling his eyes at her and i was like well that's the born role i was born to play because that's actually me so <laughs> i just booked it and yeah there's no voice it's just like hey kid you know it's it's that kind of thing where you just through yourself which i like too because it's just you don't have to focus on oh what's my dialect and where's my pitch and all that stuff yeah so do you think you will do this the rest of your life? Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm a voiceover coach also. So um, when I'm not voicing, I'm also coaching other people to do what I do. Now, what what was your your childhood like? Where were you born and raised? I was born in Australia, but I only lived there for two years. So I was a baby when we left. My parents are American and lived in a, upstate New York and San Francisco, but ultimately grew up in Westport, Connecticut. And so my, my parents are lovely. They're together still. Um, just a like very suburban kind of family with a little sister and um, no dramatic trauma or anything like that, which is pretty rare. So I feel very grateful to have grown up with parents who were who have a beautiful relationship and they were very loving and they were financially stable by the time I was older. And so we were able to, I had a very, very nice life, like a very comfortable life. And I'm very grateful they were able to put me through college without me having to struggle. So I just, it, that part of life was actually, you know, apart from just middle school sucking and social, you know, yeah, mid, actually elementary school was no walk in the park either. And then, but that's the extent of it. And I feel really grateful that I have very supportive parents. They're both still alive also, which is amazing and doing really in good health. So to be a middle aged woman with parents that are, in their late 70s and 80, early 80s, respectively, and they're still thriving. I'm very, 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 very lucky. And I have a sister who's my best friend. So, Oh, awesome. Yeah. And, and they're in Connecticut still? They are in now. They were in California, which is what brought me out to California. And then now they're in Richmond, Virginia. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, growing up, um, did you have any kind of spirituality or religious foundation or anything like that? I, my parents both, my dad was Apparently not an atheist, I thought so, but he's a day a deist. And what does that mean? It means there's like one big source, but it's not a source. It's not it's just doesn't have any it doesn't interfere with your life. It's just sort of like the source from which we all came, which actually is kind of sort of what I feel now. But he just wasn't religious. He um in Sunday school he went and he was a kid, he went up to the I don't know, the teacher, the pastor, whatever, and was like you mean to tell me this guy, Jesus, walked on water? He's like, I don't buy it. So he was like not into religion at all. And then my mother, also not religious, but pretty low-key spiritual, like didn't talk about it or didn't do anything. She wasn't like reading crystals or anything, but she would have a lot of coincidences happen, coincidences, quote unquote, right. which were actually synchronicities where she would have premonitions or she had spirit encounters that she would share with us, but it wasn't like every day. It was just like psychic things all the time with her. Um, and then she took some psychic development classes. So we didn't go to church, but my friends did. And I was really wanting to go to church. So I asked my parents if we could go to Methodist church. They were bored out of their minds, but they let me go to be in Sunday school. And they were like, hey, we're not really feeling this, but can we go to Unitarian church instead? So they took me and my sister to Unitarian church. And then my dad was out, but my mom just said, I like this. It's community for the kids. And um, being a very waspy town, I played Rosa Parks in the Christmas pageant. We read Tao of Pooh instead of uh, the Bible. So it's a pretty progressive church. Um, and then I didn't want to really go. And so mom's like, eh, it's fine. We don't have to. But she bought me the children's Bible and I liked the stories in it. And I asked her, was this real? And she said, you know, some people believe it is and some people don't. And she's like, you can decide for yourself. So Love I didn't. That. Yeah. She's like, I, it's, it's cool stories. And what do you think? So and I wasn't you yeah, at that time, probably around seven, maybe, or eight. And I didn't choose religion. 
And I don't think I, I don't know, as I got older, I didn't, I just didn't think about it. I don't know if I didn't, I would say I'm probably, I was probably agnostic. I just didn't think about God and Jesus and all that stuff at all. It just wasn't really part of my life and we didn't do grace or anything, but I just knew I had some, yeah, my mom would sometimes share things with me like, oh, I woke up and saw this, my cousin woke up and saw a spirit at the end of the bed, or I knew that before it was going to happen and we'd go, oh, cool. But I just didn't really give it much thought. You didn't see that as something spiritual or something special no. or anything like that? No, I really was just being a kid and not really focused, thinking about it at all. And when was the first time that you had some sort of supernatural experience? I was about, let's see, well, I was about 11 years old and I was in my parents' room Nobody cares, but I, this is how I'm, I'm remembering it vividly. And I was on the phone with my friend Holly, and I looked out the back window, and there was a big craft hovering over the woods, and it had three, it was like triangular, and then it had like a red, blue, and a green light at the end of each. It was like primary colors. And I looked out the window, I'm like, I think there's a helicopter out there. But then... I noticed it wasn't making any noise at all. It was dead quiet. And then I'm like staring at it going, is that a UFO? What is that? A UFO? And then all of a sudden it just shot straight up in the air and was gone. And I just said to her, I think I just saw a UFO. And the next day she said um, that there had been sightings reported. And it was like in the newspaper or something that other people had seen it too. But again, I, I don't know. I didn't really think much about it. And then two years later or so, I turned off my light to go to sleep. And all of a sudden, this big blue orb appeared above my bed, but it wasn't transparent. It was like, as if you, it was like electric blue, mm -hmm. just as if there was an electric blue light in front of me with my eyes. I saw it. It was about this big and it hovered and it was like, it had Tinkerbell energy. It was looking at me, like tilting its little head. It was just, it just was a ball. It was tilting its head back and forth and looking at me. And I, and then it was like, it was like flip dance. It was sort of like dancing and jumping around. And I got so scared that I screamed and it just shot up and disappeared and was gone. And I called my mom into my room and she's like, I just remember, she's like, your eyes are just playing tricks on you. I just go back to sleep. And again, didn't think much about, I don't know. I wasn't like, I have to get to the bottom of this. I was just oh, like, that was know. weird. No, I was just like, that was weird. It was the eighties and there was no, I didn't, I, there was no Google there was or no anything. Context for it no. Or, yeah. It didn't have you knew, yeah. you knew enough to say, hey, that might have been a UFO. Yeah, or something. Actually, I I didn't know. And then later I thought it might have been a spirit. But then later I realized, like just only in the last few years, was I have I figured out that was an interdimensional being. Like the, the blue. Yep. The orb. Right. Because okay. I also didn't know that I believed in that stuff. I thought UFOs were just government. Actually, I know. When I saw the UFO, I just thought it was government stuff. So even I wasn't at that young age, even at that young, I was like, it's probably just like the air force testing stuff out. I didn't really have. Yeah. I just, I don't, I don't really remember, but I know that my thought was always a logical one. Like, oh, that was probably just this, or I don't know. That was some kind of weird light anomaly. I didn't know about interdimensional beings. And I also didn't understand then that interdimensional beings from quote unquote outer space are really spiritual beings. and that ghosts and spirits are one in the same, that they're kind of like, that they're all the same, same thing. So that's, I didn't have any spirit encounters that I know of. I'm sure I did. I have a memory of being three and I had the chicken pox. And I remember seeing a tall man walking up and down our driveway and he was wearing a top hat and like a jet. He looked like he was from the 1800s, but I thought I was just hallucinating because I was really sick. I had like 103 fever and I did tend to hallucinate when I was sick. So I still don't know if it was a hallucination, but that's the only thing I can think of that would be spirit related, um, that maybe he was real. Um, but I just didn't, I, I was three, so I wasn't so aware. These, these experiences happen um, and you remember that at three years old. Yeah, I do. Wow. That's a I have very, a very memory. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. I remember being two like it was yesterday because I had a lot going on at that time. There was a lot of really significant stuff happening with my, I had a large birthmark on my face. So I was born very sensitive. And then when I was out in public, kids were always staring and pointing and calling me ugly. So I stopped talking. 
one day I just stopped talking and I didn't talk again for three years. So I was going to therapy. I was selective mute. We now know it was anxiety, but the doctors thought I was autistic. I had a really high IQ, but I wasn't speaking and I wasn't showing any emotion. And how old were you at that time? I think from two to five, like two, two or three to five years old. Yeah. And you were saying that you were sensitive, but do you mean sensitive in the kind of psychic way uh, or sensitive as in the emotional way? Emotional way. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I know now that it's the same thing. I was a highly sensitive person, mm-hmm. but it manifested as just worrying all the time. I had such severe anxiety that I just shut down and no one really understood that then. Like, I don't know that they realized that it was just me being sensitive. It wasn't autism. I remember they put electrodes on my brain and did testing and stuff like that. And that was in the seventies. So I don't know what they were looking for, but they were trying to see if something was wrong with my brain. They're like, she's highly intelligent, but she won't emote or talk to anyone except my baby sister. But I wouldn't talk to my parents. I wouldn't talk to anyone. And I wouldn't show emotion. Like that was like a switch that went on. One day, I just remember. I remember, like, again, my memories could be muddled because I was only two. But I remember my dad walking to the kitchen, and my dad said, "Do you want some waffles?" And I just felt paralyzed. I just couldn't talk. Like I was terrified to talk, and so I just didn't. And I, I don't know if that's their experience of it, but I remember suddenly feeling too anxious to speak. Well. Which it's an anxiety disorder, elective mutism, selective mutism, but I didn't, no one knew why I just stopped talking. Usually it comes from trauma, but nothing had happened to me that I can. The UFO. Well, that was later though. That was like, that was when I was like a teenager. So. Right, right, right. right. Okay. Well, maybe that was a second visit. Yeah. I, it was just overwhelm, anxiety and overwhelm. Have you ever been hypnotized? I don't know if I can be. I, I No, I've tried to do like past life regressions and I can never really, I never really feel like I go under. Could be. I could. I just don't really feel like I'm really in there. Very interesting. Yeah. So when did you start speaking again? When I was five. And that was through a long process of my parents working with therapists and my teachers and they... I mean, they tried all sorts of things because they're like, she has to understand that if she doesn't speak, she's not going to get what she needs. So for years, they're like, if she doesn't ask for it, she can't have it. It's like one day in kindergarten, we were, it was gingerbread decorating day and I was so excited about it. And they're like, if you don't ask, you can't do it. And so I was the only kid that didn't get to make a gingerbread man. So, and I'm sure it killed my parents. I'm sure it was like really hard for them, but they're like, she can't just not. They, she has to ask. She can't. She has to learn that if she doesn't use her voice, she's not going to get what she needs. Um, and then the way they finally got me talking was I was really obsessed with The Wizard of Oz and I wanted to be the Wicked Witch of the West. I would write to my mom. So that's how I would write her notes. So that's how she knew what I needed. And I said, I want to be the Wicked Witch of the West. And so she said, the therapist and my mom said the therapist was like, here's how we're going to get her to try. We're going to try. So you don't have to be in the room with her because that's too anxiety producing, but put a tape recorder in front of her. And then all she has to do is say the first sound of the word, witch. doesn't have to say the whole word. Just so my mom left me in a room with a tape recorder and said, if you want to be the wicked witch of the West, you just have to say the w sound. And I sat there for it felt like hours. I don't know exactly how much time it was. I was terrified to do it because I felt like if I did it, everyone was going to make a fuss and all the attention was going to be on me. And that was going to make me really uncomfortable. And so I had to like talk with myself. Come on. You just like, I wanted it so bad. So I finally did it. And then my mom came in and checked that I had done it. And then she said, afterwards, I looked at her and said, mommy. And she just like froze and said, yeah. And I said, tell me. And she goes, tell me what? And I said, tell me everything. And she said, we stayed up late that night. And I asked her all the questions that I had wanted to ask. Like, why is the sky blue? What is, you know, like asking all everything of these things. came flooding out. Yeah. And, and, ever, and then I just started talking again. Wow. What a story. Yeah. That was a big obstacle 
to overcome. Yeah. That's why I remember everything from age two, because it was so, it wasn't a normal childhood. I mean, my parents were great. It wasn't them. It was just that I was, I had severe anxiety to the point of not being able to speak. Um, and I, my therapist said, children do that because it's the only sense of control they have. Yeah. So, and he said, adults usually turn to anorexia, although unfortunately some little kids do too. It's not about the food or the weight. It's about having control. If I'm feeling, and I did have anorexia later in life and it's not about the weight. It's not about the food. It's about I need to have, feel a sense of control and if I can control something. So it's just an outlet for feeling like you're losing control. And they say, he said the only thing a child has uh, control over is their voice. And so that's the one thing they can shut down without, you know, suffering too much from it. Now, you've said that you haven't had any trauma in your life and you had a really amazing childhood and great parents. Yeah. But yet you suffered from these conditions that typically are produced through a trauma. Yeah. Right? So would you say the trauma was, so I'm assuming you had yeah. major surgeries, right? To, I to remove. Did. Mark, mark. I had that when I was seven. I had one when I was six and one when I was seven. So I had to have two plastic surgeries to remove the birthmark. And then, then they had to do a um, scar redefin I don't know what they called it, but like refinement because it was thick and big because they had, it was, it took up like the whole side of my face. So they had to like really pull things together. Mm. And, but it really, the trauma was being a highly sensitive person and then going out in the world, self-conscious already. And then having people stare and point at me. So I didn't want to be seen because the only response I would get was negative. So instead of going, oh, what a cute little girl, it was like, what's that thing on your face? And so I just retreated and I didn't want to be seen. So I just was like, well, if I don't talk, then no one sees me. So it's like little kids. They, they think if they cover their face, you can't see them. And so right. I thought, well, if I don't talk or if I don't show any emotion, then no one can really see me. So even just when they took photos of me in, in nursery school for, I remember like when they came to take our pictures for class. They were trying to make me laugh and they had, the guy had a cookie monster puppet and he's like, come on, you're going to, I, my picture is like dead pan, no expression. I didn't want anyone to see my vulnerability because that would mean they'd have to see me. So I never wanted, and when kids were mean to me, I just stayed quiet. I was like a fire starter. I would just be like dead quiet, no response. I didn't want them to know that they hurt me. And I didn't want them to know that they got to me. So I remember like one little girl was being mean to me. And I, I was like a, the bad seed or something where like she stood and it was sort of like these kids were being mean to me and I didn't do anything or say anything, but I was on the swing and I just kind of like my left my feet out and she got knocked down by the swing and she was screaming and I just kept swinging like, oh, like a wow. psychopath. And it was like, wow, I felt bad, but I didn't want to show anything. So I just would be like, totally deadpan so that no one knew. So how did you segue into adulthood with the, with this trauma truly? Oh my God. Um, that's a whole lifetime that, that I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I learned to be a people pleaser so that no one wouldn't like me. And I went into elementary school with lots of friends because I was nice to everybody. And I learned to just, if I'm nice to everybody, no one can be mean to me. So, or if I, um, I just say yes to everything. So I was not bullied at all, but I was, I was by my friends who would step, who'd walk all over me. And I kind of let, I picked friends who were very bossy and I would just let them lead me around and like, tell me what to do. And then in middle school, I learned that if I was put myself down first, then no one else could do it first. So that's how I became, yeah, that's how I became funny is I developed a very self-deprecating sense of humor where I would make fun of myself all the time, which is, th you know, then I learned to phase out of that. But I ended up being voted most changed because then I decided to, like, I wasn't too wild at all, but I had, I started to dress more like ripped jeans and writing on my jeans and my, you know, just kind of developing like a, like a 
funkier Your style. Persona. Yeah. Yeah. Like an artsier style. And I started to hang out with all the artsy kids and they were really nice kids. So it was like a beautiful, like really healthy, lovely group of kids that were all just, we would just do innocent things like go to the beach together, go to the fair mm-hmm. together. But then in high school, the people pleasing led to boys didn't like me because I wasn't the pretty one. And so I became very You're beautiful. Thank you. I was just you know, the big feathered bangs, the braces, the gap between my teeth. Like I wasn't hideous, but I was not, I wasn't fashion, you know, I was not, I was like medium cute, like not definitely not a hot girl at all or anything like that. And so I really got, I had some really great friends and who are still my friends, but there were a lot of friends that were kind of mean to me or put me down and I kind of just took the abuse And then this led to sex and love addiction, which is um, needing validation from other people. And I just got really into, like, at 16 was my first boyfriend. I'd never even dated anyone. I mean, I, so this girl came up to me in the cafeteria and was like, there's this boy that likes you. I'm like, where is he? She's like, cross there. And he sent a note with her that said, will you be my girlfriend? And I just went, yes, sight unseen, because... He liked Somebody me. Somebody wanted you. Yeah. Somebody wanted me. So it started a whole thing of getting pressured into things I wasn't ready for very quickly. Like I, I was so naive about sex and things like that. And, and before you know it, I'm like drinking, smoking cigarettes, having sex, you know, doing all the things at a young age that I was still able to keep my grades up. And I was still, but, but I was not, but I was, had very low self-esteem. And then going into college, chasing boys like boy crazy and then they would dump me and then I'd go insane and then become a stalker like not not like a serious stalker but embarrassing stuff and that just led to an adult uh experience of constantly being with people that were incapable of loving me because I didn't feel lovable and so I have to be I have to be something that I'm not I have to like people please or I have to do things I'm not comfortable with and then I have to learn how to seduce people because that's the only way that I feel wanted and then before you know it I'm like dating all these guys that are completely unavailable not invested in a real relationship and so that eventually led me into sex and love addicts anonymous but that didn't even happen until the I was in my mid thirties after blowing up a marriage where I married someone I wasn't attracted to, but he was my best friend. And so all of this to say your traumas in childhood can be what they call big traumas or they can be little traumas. It's how you perceive them. Right. You know, it's like you can have PTSD from a war or you can have PTSD from being, having your feelings hurt. It, it, your brain, it's how your brain responds to it. And I don't have PTSD, but have friends who do. And they weren't in a war, they weren't assaulted, but they were very sensitive. And over time, they developed complex PTSD from just normal life stuff, like for people dying or um, work stress or whatever. So it's really how you perceive it and then how you perceive yourself. So ultimately, I became my therapist that I was one of the sickest sex and love addicts he'd ever treated. So um, the now, on the other end of that, I'm I'm writing a book, which it's taking forever. So Don't look out for it anytime soon, but it'll be great when it's, but it's about this journey of losing my voice, finding myself, finding my voice, and then losing my voice again as an adult to a vocal disorder. Okay. This is just so fascinating. I mean, I know from a karmic perspective, it's like using your voice. I know. For your work. Yeah. And, you know, from zero to seven years old, your yeah. brain is in theta state. So yeah. theta is hypnosis. So you are being, everyone is in hypnosis from zero to seven years old. So that's why psychiatrists always go back to your childhood, because it's right. not that we're blaming parents or they're blaming parents. It's that you look for the patterns. Isn't it wild? So yeah. What happened during zero to seven years old basically imprints you for what you will continue on in your play called life and you can have different players different characters but the theme is going to continue to play out and yeah your theme is just so out there I mean because when you lose your voice I mean a lot of people have a theme but you would never know 
right? right? Because yeah. they're navigating out. But when you literally lose your voice, your center of communication, the most profound thing that we can do with our communication, really. Um, wow. So when did you yeah. lose it again? So, you know, cutting to the future, I ended up becoming a voice actor professionally. And it took a long time to really make it. You know, I had to still work day jobs and cater and do catering jobs and babysitting jobs. And then when I finally, quote unquote, made it, I had two good years of a six-figure income acting, using my voice, and then I lost my voice for three years. So I developed a vocal disorder called muscle tension dysphonia and vocal cord dysfunction, which we know spiritually that was all part of the theme right? Like, it's like, huh, it's no surprise. I'm like, God couldn't have written a better screenplay because just when I started to succeed, my voice was like, bye, I'm gone. And so there's like a lot of fear of lack stuff in there. Were you I, conscious of that when it was happening? No, I just had really bad, re I had um, SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And because of the acid that was coming up, it was burning my vocal cords. And so they started spasming so they wouldn't close. So then but you weren't conscious that this was like a huge sign. No. Okay. And so I had to give up my voiceover career and then the pandemic hit. So I went from making six figures for two years, loving my life to suddenly I couldn't even talk. I was like this. And I had to stop doing voiceover and then the pandemic hit. So there were no jobs and it just wasn't anything I could do. And I was living on credit cards for like two years. and. um during that time, I had I went to a vocal coach, and she said, the problem is you now have muscle tension dysphonia, which is a secondary vocal disorder, which is tension in your throat from the stress of it all, but also because talking with, without your vocal cords closing, it, you're straining to get the sound out. And so it creates new neural pathways in your brain, where now your brain is like, oh, this is how we're going to talk now. So everything rewires the wrong way. So straining, uh, talking becomes effortful. And when you're talking, you're like straining like this. And so your body doesn't know how to talk without straining. And then your whole throat becomes rigor mortis. And then every time you try to talk, you go into an anxiety attack. Wow. And so then it becomes a mind-body syndrome where it becomes panic around speaking. So I could talk normally. So like after about a year or two, I could talk normally. But if I got in front of the microphone, my brain would go, we're doing that thing again, panic. And I could, and I literally couldn't speak. It was, it was, and now it's back to the anxiety disorder. Not that I couldn't express myself. I literally couldn't form the muscle. The muscles wouldn't come together. And so I would be like talking normally and then I'd go, okay, now I have to perform. And it was like, I can't. And everything would like get all weird and breathy. Wow. And so then my vocal coach said, because it's tension, there's nothing we can do except work on relaxing your body because it's not your vocal cords. Right. I went to every doctor in, in LA and they were like, your vocal cords are fine. It's the muscles that are so tight. They're pulling your vocal cords apart. So they're not. You're moving. resisting, right? So what you resist persists. So you're resisting that experience. Yes. And she said, and I said, well, how long till I get my voice back? She said, I'm not going to tell you how long because that's not helpful. And good thing, because it was four years. And I don't think she wanted me to get discouraged because um, she'd had the same disorder. Oh. Lots, of vo lots of voice actors get it. Lots of teachers get it. Lots of tour guides get it. Hmm. People who have to give presentations get it. Because over time, you're using your voice so much that your, your vocal muscles tire. And then all the muscles around there come in to help because you're just, after talking all day, all day, you're having vocal fatigue. Then you get home to your family and you've got to talk to your family. And then you go back and teach the next day and over time. So she said, the only thing to do right now is read the power of now, do yoga, meditate. I was so frustrated, but I did what she said. And what year was that? Mm, three, uh, four years ago, I think so. Awesome. Around then. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was during the pandemic. So we were on lockdown. And I don't know why, but I started, I, I'd always really, I'd gotten really into watching near-death experience videos. But now I started reading like 
I don't know why. I mean, well, I know why now, but I just wanted to read all the books from all the mediums. So I read everybody who has a book on mediumship. Suzanne Giesman's book was one of them. John Holland's book was one of them. The Long Island Medium, Kim Russo. And all of them said that anyone can learn mediumship. And I didn't know that. I thought they just were born that way and how lucky for them. Right, right. Especially Which they were. Gifts, right. Mm -hmm. Which they were because they were kids that saw spirit and I didn't know that I was. But it also runs in families. So your mom. Yeah. She's highly intuitive. Or is sensitive. Yeah. Or is sensitive, right. Yeah. And she just never did anything with it, but she has a curiosity. And now that I'm doing it, she likes to. We do exercises together. We'll go to the battlegrounds okay. and be like, what can we pick up? And she'll pick up a name and then there it will be on a headstone or something. Oh, so, cool. yeah, so she's into it. And so, yeah, I started taking classes um, with the Arthur Finley School online with Monica the Medium, who was a great teacher. Some local mediums that I knew already, Fl uh, Medium Fleur, Susan Sh um, Schuler, And I was like, well, I don't know that I can do this because I've never done it before and soon found out that I could do it. And Monica's class really, really kind of put me over the edge. I showed up thinking, I'm not going to be able to do this. And she's like, you're doing it. You're doing it right now. And, and so I just, there was one other, per uh, oh, Rick, Rick, the theater person. Um, <laughs> is he also very spiritual, Rick? Yes. He's, he's showing he was, me yeah. like, He's almost coming forth as like a real hippie to me. Um, uh -huh. Like he's coming forth as nature and yeah. meditation circles. And like, yeah. he's very, very in the spiritual world. So for him, this is just par for the course. Uh, it's like, I'm on. Yep. I knew I was where I was going. I, I saw it. I knew it. I believed it. Uh, there's Buddhism imagery around him as well, mm -hmm. like a Buddhist statue. And just he's a real seeker of him getting chills from him. He's a real seeker. He also would have been communing with spirit very often. Um, and uh, and also tells me that you and he have communicated very clearly from the other side. Like awesome. we Thank have folk. I get chills, full, uh -huh. full chills uh, conversations like you hear mm -hmm. his him back and uh -huh. he's like yep you're he's like we are in that's awesome. always been there's always been a connection between the two of you that was really strong and powerful a really good friendship but also he's and music is very important to him as well um which it is to a lot of people but it's like he's very tuned in with music um performing music singing playing um i don't know if he played guitar but like he's playing in, it's like there's a feeling of him drumming or just participating in music in a way that even if he's not a professional he's like will pick he's the, he will pick up an instrument and just mess around with it kind of thing he just feels really connected with with music and feeling and he just said like when i cross over you won't believe like the angel music on the other side was like beyond anything it's it's like they were singing to me and it was even more than i could have imagined it feels like that uh and also He's wearing like bracelets too. Um, and I don't know if he gave you one or that there's like a feeling of him having. Does a bracelet mean anything to you with him? I don't I know. I mean, he why. wore them. Okay. I just yeah. feel like I may just be seeing them and I just wanted to check like he's just wearing like these mala beads or, so, or like rope hemp. I, I just sort of mm -hmm. saw like hemp bracelets on his arms. Um, but he's like really at peace with. Uh, why is he showing me his foot? Is he like missing a toe or something? Not that I know. Okay. Of. Is there somebody that's missing a toe? I don't know. That's a really random one. Just take that and do yeah. what you want. There's something about like a toe, which is really random. Um, but yeah, I, it's just an acknowledgement of really being connected here. Like, you know that you hear his voice as clear as day in your head. Like, um, he's like, we don't, there isn't really a, a gap between us. And I'm also being drawn to, to pulled to say it's like the Beatles song across the universe. Um, yeah, it's it's a image of that being what heaven is like. There's like a okay. rainbow, and there's I mean I, I don't know if I don't know the song, so I'll look it oh, up. Oh oh yeah, look it's it's actually it's a really beautiful song. It's a beautiful song by the Beatles that um, I'm just gonna tell you. I want to share that because. Uh, lyrics um it's honest it's like the way he's describing the other side 
as it's it's a it's a mantra i'm getting chills he's it's like it's and I, just a, a little um a snippet from it is jai guru deva om nothing's going to change my world sounds of laughter shades of life are ringing i'm getting chills through my open ears inciting and inviting me limitless undying love with shines around me with like a million suns it calls me on and across the universe and it's jai guru deva om nothing's gonna change my mind Beautiful. Uh, yeah I'm, and i i was not in key there but um yeah i feel like he's always been connected to the other side um yes and very connected to you i kind of was like is there anything else but i think that's just it i think you know i think you already know that that's he's awesome your, that he's is like a, just... he's sort of like a guide i mean not that not everyone who passes becomes a guide, but yeah. he is a guide for you where you really have a strong relationship with him and he's yeah. guiding you and helping you. And he's also helping you in your writing um, by Ooh. inspiring you. There's, uh, I don't know if you wrote poetry, but he's very good with words and um, putting words together. And so it's more of just like a, he's just inspiring you, helping helping to give you creative ideas. Uh, and who did he belong to again? Was it Tammy? Yes. Okay. Well, that not at the end they split okay. they split but... yeah i'm seeing him riding a bike too did he i don't does that mean anything to you he's riding a bicycle yeah. riding a bicycle around and it doesn't look like a fancy bicycle it looks like one that you pick up on the side of the road and just like <laughs> cruise down the road on it so that might i don't know Could if that be. means anything to you but yeah. uh it just and he's also a traveler it's a like he's showing me different landscapes of different places that he's visited um there's more like i'm seeing a place that i went to in costa rica i don't know if you ever if you know that he ever went there but there's like this it's it's an image of i i was riding a bike down this road into town in this town in costa rica and there's like beach scenes going by so i don't know if that's somewhere he traveled but there's just a he feeling did travel of, a lot okay it's so. it may be just a happy yeah. memory of international travel and mm -hmm. really feeling comfortable in that element but now he gets to travel wherever he wants to and see all the things that he didn't get to see while he was here it's like i can see thailand and anytime i just want to be there um I, I do feel like he went to thailand i don't know if you know that but there's like a, a feeling of palm trees and elephants and some kind of it's like a kind of a bali or it's some kind of a like asian vibe indonesia something of that nature okay um, but but he's just like now i can just jump into any place that i want to go and um yeah just he doesn't even want to, he doesn't even want to talk about how he passed he's just like it's all good like he's just it doesn't he's like i don't i didn't pass i just went into another place so i have a question for him yeah and actually a couple people before we wrap up yeah um any guidance anything to share yes. that that From will help me yeah yeah um okay okay there's a real sense first of all of him believing in you so much he always has uh really really and he, and he would have been he acted as a mentor in the sense that he was like you can do anything like you can really do anything there's nothing stopping you um and again there's this creative muse feeling but there's also a need to there's a like a he's showing me an amethyst and that is a uh he's showing me helping you to heal and i know that you've done a lot of healing work on yourself but there's still like again we talked about this earlier about this feeling of self-doubt which mm -hmm. no one would know from looking at you at all that you have any self-doubt but we're all human and we do but there's I'm seeing the full card too, you know, the full card in the tarot card, which is yep. take a leap of faith. Don't your, our inclination is, oh, I, but it has to be perfect first. I want it to be perfect, but it's like, let go of the perfectionism, take a leap of faith, just do it. Just, just do the thing. Um, move forward with intention, move forward with letting go of that, that, uh, that like, He's like, I know you. I've known you all along. And so he's seen you in all of your incarnations. But he's like, you're you're here. This is like, again, this is sort of the same kind of message that your, I think it was your dad, about moving forward, letting go of any kind of self-doubt, really having faith that you will be led in the right direction. Um, but it, this, this thing that you're about to do is like a huge leap of faith. And so this feels more like a writing project or creative project. It's your own idea that you're putting into motion that really requires just 
not self-editing, not, um, it's like him. He just kind of says that he was sort of somebody that just sort of took risks without thinking of it as a risk. It He sort of is very open and trusts himself. And it's also what makes him a good performer and actor is the just trusting the flow, trusting going with exactly what is in your heart and, and resisting the urge to say, oh, but what if this, but what if that, or how's that going to happen? It's like, just know that we're pushing you on the right path to this next project. Does that make sense to you? Uh-huh. Okay. There's, it's like a new project that's an extension, an offshoot of like your book. Um, but there's just sort of more to be done. And it just is a matter of kind of figuring out the kinks, but it also shows, and I don't know why I'm seeing, did he read tarot cards? We, yeah, we did. Okay. Cause he's showing me all these tarot cards. Like he's showing me the nine of cups, which is abundance. Um, it's abundance is coming. And it's like that image of somebody taking a leap of faith and then receiving all the abundance that comes with it. And he's kind of like, trust that that's coming. Trust that you are worthy of it, even though you might logically know you're worthy of it. There's like this old voice that's like, is it though? Do I? Does, can I make this work? But the feeling is, yeah, he just keeps showing me like, show me the tower card now. And the tower, that's why I feel like he reads tarot mm -hmm. because he's talking in terms of tarot of the tower card where Things fall apart so that better things can come together. I don't feel like it's like a major, massive, your life is falling apart, but it's like thing, things as you know it are crumbling to give root to new. So it's burning to the ground so that new roots and new grass can form. Everything's very symbolic and image with him. Like every, it's a lot of imagery. Um, and leaving eight, eight of cups, leaving the past behind. It's kind of, it's moving on to a new chapter in your life and leaving the past behind. But um, I do, yeah, it's the weird how he's like reading your tarot. And he's like showing me him reading your tarot. That's awesome. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. It's beautiful. Thank you so very much. Thank you really so much. I appreciate that. You're so welcome. Thank you so much for letting me. That's a me... great way to end it. He's, yeah. He's a, a very special being. I feel that. I feel really a lot of warmth around him and a very sensitive man, um, like a very sensitive feminine in his feminine is yes. kind of how I feel him yep. in his feminine energy and really loving women and respecting women. Yep. And that's really important to him. It's really important to him. I think he talks about a divine feminine kind of. I hope you enjoyed the introduction to voice actor and psychic medium, Shannon Torrance. We so appreciate you hanging out with us. Shannon and I met when she asked me to be on her podcast, Magic is Real on YouTube to discuss my book, Temple of All-Knowing, and speak to my near-death experience. We were fast and furious friends at that point. Please check out her full bio and links to Shannon's podcast, Magic is Real, my episode, and other ways to connect with Shannon for a mediumship reading or voice acting coaching. All is indicated in the links in the description. There is so much more to come. So be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss part two.